The dawn of the 20th century ushers in a period of political violence unprecedented in the history of modern China. This is the age of uprising, insurrection, bombing, and assassination. The question is, is this the bloody dawn of a new era? October the 26th, 1900, all is quiet. These are turbulent times. It's been a trying day for the governor of Guangdong, Guangxi, but he sleeps the sleep of the just nonetheless, confident that no harm will come to him while he's locked in Morpheus' embrace. Security here at the residence is watertight. However, he's in for a very rude awakening. The real threat lies just below his feet, a tunnel stuffed with 200 pounds of high explosive. Guangzhou has always been a fractious and rebellious city, as far as the authorities of the Qing Dynasty are concerned. In July, a local Christian appears in one of the city's many churches. He looks troubled, like he's bearing some great burden. Some words from the Bible are weighing on his conscience. Thou shalt not kill. Up to now, living up to that commandment has never been a problem. But all that's about to change. So far, 1900 has been a disastrous year for the Qing Dynasty. The first month of the new century sees Empress Dowager Cixi embracing the cause of an avowedly anti-foreign martial arts society known as the Boxers. The results are disastrous. With official recognition, the movement snowballs and the Boxers march on Beijing and lay siege to the legations of the foreign powers. The armies of eight of these powers invade China, break the siege and sack Beijing. The Qing court abandons the capital. For opponents of the dynasty, it's a golden opportunity. A few months after the Boxer debacle, Sun Yat-sen, leader of the Revive China Society, persuades its military conference that armed struggle is the only way of ridding China of the Qing. His right-hand man, Jiang Shiliang, is instructed to head an uprising in Huizhou. A simultaneous revolt is planned to take place in Guangzhou. The troubled man in the church is one of the ringleaders of the Guangzhou uprising, 21-year-old Xu Jianru. His organizational abilities have enabled him to weld the disparate factions discontented with the incompetence of the Qing into a formidable rebel force. The uprising is ready to start as soon as a consignment of arms and ammunition arrives from abroad. The problem is, it never does. Worst of all, word of the planned uprising in Huizhou gets out and it has to be launched prematurely without support from Guangzhou. Jian Ru and his rebels are caught unprepared by this sudden turn of events. With a massive Qing army marching southwards, the rebels will surely be cut to pieces without support from Guangzhou. Yet without weapons, the Guangdong rebels can't launch their uprising. But they also can't just sit there. They have to do something. The 
Events in far-off Beijing offer them a chance to strike. The governor of Guangdong, Guangxi, Li Hongzhan, is one of China's most able negotiators. With negotiations underway with the foreign occupiers, he's been summoned to the capital. His replacement, De Shou, has learned the hard way that this is no easy billet. The South is rife with talk of rebellion and sedition. He learns that a well-armed force of 20,000 are about to launch an uprising. There's also talk of assassination. He knows he is at the top of the rebels' hit list. But little does he know how perilously close that danger is. Not long after De Shou's arrival, Xu Jian Ru starts frequenting a tea house. Although he comes from a rich family and can afford to live a life of leisure, he's never been keen on whiling away his time in tea houses. But it's not a sudden conversion to the pleasures of the teacup that's brought him here. Instead, it's one of the windows, a window that provides him with a unique vantage point from which to put one of the skills he's learned in his church-run polytechnic to good use. Surveying. Here in a house in Guangzhou's Ho Fang Alley, rented on behalf of the Revive China Society, the conspirators discuss Xu Jian Ru's findings. Just one alleyway separates them from the governor's residence. What's more, Xu Jian Ru has something to show for all the time he spent gazing out of the tea house window. It's a plan of the governor's house. Now the conspirators know exactly where Du Shou sleeps. They come to a grave decision. But the obstacles standing in their path are formidable. As rumors of plots and assassination attempts fly around the city, De Shou tightens security at the residence. There's now no way they can get close enough to the governor to kill him with a gun or grenade. Their solution is brilliantly simple. They might not be able to get through this ring of steel, but they can get under it. Sleeping by day and working all through the night, the four-man assassination team begins burrowing its way to De Shou's bedroom. Shu Jian Ru's elder brother, Shu Gu Yu, is his brother's most stalwart supporter. Although he's all too aware of his younger brother's slight stature and frail constitution, his brother's deep knowledge of Chinese and world history and his determination to earn a place for himself in the history books gives him faith in the cause and his brother's leadership. A long series of disasters and humiliations has driven them to this drastic course. First, it was defeat at the hands of the Japanese. Now it's the havoc wrought by the Boxer debacle and foreign occupation. All doubt has been dispelled. There is no hope of national salvation while the Qing is still in power. As Xu Jian Ru wrote, we must dedicate ourselves to one task, the destruction of the country as it stands, as this will cost us our lives the task of reconstruction must be left to others. By October, they're almost ready. In the dead of night, under the cover of darkness, members of the revived China Society steal into the house in Holofang. They carry with them a dozen heavy metal canisters. 
Shi Jianru has staked everything on this gamble. The 200 pounds of high explosive contained within these canisters is more than enough to blow De Shou to kingdom come. But should the plot fail, he knows there will be no escape for him. He's already sold most of the family estate to pay for the 200 pounds of high explosive, leaving enough to enable his sister and mother to flee to Macau. Nashinitai As the days pass, it becomes increasingly clear to Xu Jian Ru that the Huizhou Rebellion is headed for disaster. The forces that De Shou has at his disposal massively outnumber the rebels, and soon they'll be on the front line in full strength. If he doesn't act quickly, the rebel army will be completely annihilated. There isn't a minute to lose, yet he has reason to hesitate. Failure is unthinkable. He has to bide his time and strike when he is sure that the time is right. Then, Xu Jianru makes a discovery that galvanizes him into action. The guard in front of Dershaw's bedroom changes every four hours. When he listens carefully, he can make out the sound of their footsteps coming from above. Now, he knows exactly where Du Shou is sleeping. Underground, all is silent. Perhaps it is this deathly silence that causes him to imagine the hue and cry of the lone rebel army fighting bravely against the odds in Huizhou, and their certain fate, but nothing is done to help them. But while the assassins are being buried deep underground, important developments have taken place, ones that have brought a smile to the face of De Shou. At first, he was scared out of his wits by the rebellion. After all, the rebels gave him a run for his money, but not anymore. Japan, one of the rebels' main supporters, has now decided to throw its lot in with the Qing dynasty. At a stroke, Sun Yat-sen has been deprived of his most powerful sponsor. The game is up. 18 days of bitter fighting are over. De Shou is now looking forward to the best night's sleep he's had in a long while. But the assassins working deep underground are literally left in the dark. For the next four days, they continue to burrow away, desperate to reach De Shou's bedroom and to strike a blow against the hated Qing dynasty. Above ground, the weather is as volatile and unpredictable as the political situation. Below ground, digging now over, the assassins bring their canisters of explosives down the tunnel. They move silently, stealthily. The merest sound could alert De Shou and his men to their plot. One false move, one mistake with the detonators, and it's all over. 200 pounds of explosive. Enough to blow the whole residence and all of the assassins to kingdom come. When all is in place, they wait. They must be sure that Dershow is in bed. Now, it's the dead of night. Dershow must be in bed now. It's now or never. 
They set the detonators and light the fuse. The explosion, when it comes in a few hours, will save the beleaguered Huizhou army and rock the Qing dynasty to its very foundations. Above grounds, the idea that dangers lurk just under his floorboards never enters the wildest dreams of the slumbering De Shou. With the fuse lit, the conspirators emerge into the night. They then make their separate ways through the deserted streets of the city to the riverbank. Here, they intend to board a boat bound for Hong Kong. From there, Jian Ru will make his way to Macau. For Jian Ru, reunion with his mother and sister is just around the corner. They wait anxiously for the explosion, yet the roaring boom announcing mission accomplished fails to arrive. Something must have gone wrong. Xi Jianru is now faced with a dilemma. Should he write off the assassination and flee, or should he try to salvage what he can of the mission? He knows nothing of the failure of the Huizhou uprising. As far as he's concerned, the lives of 20,000 rebels rest on the success of this mission. The choice is clear. He orders the others to leave Guangzhou without him, and he creeps back to the house. Inside the tunnel, a pile of ash tells him what went wrong. The incense burner they'd used as a makeshift timer had burnt out before it could ignite the fuse. By this point, it's long into the day. De Shou was up and out of bed hours before. This means the second attempt on the governor's life will have to wait. He bides his time alone with nothing for company except his trusty Bible and 200 pounds of explosive. to the house of a missionary. There, fatigued, he falls into a deep sleep. When he wakes up, rudely jolted out of his slumber by an immense explosion, he naturally thinks his mission has been a success. He's soon disappointed. Far from blowing him to smithereens, the bomb merely causes De Shou to fall out of bed. Xu Jian Ru is amazed. There was 200 pounds of high explosive in that tunnel. How could it fail to eliminate the governor? His curiosity leads him to make a fatal mistake. He returns to find out what happened. He is stunned by what he finds. The blast was terrific, powerful enough to send bricks flying more than 20 meters and cause severe damage to several nearby households. To his great dismay, the Christian Xu Jianru also discovers that the blast has killed a number of innocent bystanders. 
The unintended consequences of the blast, the deaths of innocent civilians and the failure to kill the governor, leave Shi Jianru perplexed and deeply saddened. Yet it failed to kill the governor. He concludes that he didn't judge the position of the bedroom accurately enough. After his narrow escape, Du Shou immediately imposes martial law and orders a citywide search to catch the perpetrator. Shi Jianru presumes that nobody will recognize him. Moreover, there's no evidence incriminating him. The following day, he sneaks into Guangzhou and tries to melt into its perilous maze of alleyways. But all the time, his movements are being tracked by a Qing government agent called Guo Yaojie. The moment he steps inside the city, he's arrested. Zhe Jianru was brought before the Nanhai County authorities for interrogation. The torture this frail young is subjected to is brutal. All his fingernails are pulled out, and every square inch of his body is scorched with red-hot irons. Yet, he refuses to reveal any information about the other rebels. The missionaries persuade the American consul to intervene on behalf of the Christian Zhe Jianru, but there's nothing he can do. Not only has Xu Jianru made a full confession, there's also the plan he had drawn up of the governor's residence, complete with his bloody palm print. With the weight of evidence against him, there's no hope of reprieve. His last words are contained within three letters to his family, smuggled out on his behalf by a kindly prison warder. Jingan General's attempted assassination of De Shou is just the opening salvo. In the years that follow, political activists increasingly resort to assassination. But it's not until 1911 that Xi Jianru receives the recognition he deserves. He's awarded the posthumous title Grand General by Sun Yat-sen. On September the 19th, 1905, an earthquake strikes the capital of the Qing Empire. The forbidden city panics. An earthquake is an omen of impending disaster. But in the Tungchang Guildhall, on the night of the earthquake, there's one man who doesn't run off panic-stricken like everyone else. He knows exactly what disaster is in store for the Qing dynasty.